Welcome back to Art and Artifact. I'm Pastor Carol Clark. Art and Artifact is one of my class series at Faith Lutheran Church, and it's being posted now in video recordings to encourage you in your study of the Word. Each topic is shared in three video sessions on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday every week. Since this is Monday, this is session one of three for this week. Let's begin with prayer. Lord, draw us near and speak to our hearts through your word. Give us understanding and bring us wisdom so that we are emboldened like the Apostle Paul to reach out to others with the truth. Give us courage to be your disciples, making more disciples through the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. This week, we continue to focus on Paul's missionary journeys. Here's this week's key objects. What we have is a collection of body parts molded from clay and painted. Archaeologists have dug up this awesome variety of clay models of arms, legs, genitals, breasts, eyes, and ears amidst the ruins of a temple in ancient Corinth. This week, as usual, we will explore scripture and history, and then we'll get back to this image to apply that important background information. Today, we return to Paul's travels. When we left him last week, Paul had established the first church in Philippi at the home of Lydia. Philippi's up in Macedonia. From Philippi, Paul and his companions traveled to Thessalonica. This was the largest town in Macedonia at the time. The church that Paul founds in Thessalonica will be his second church plant or mission church in Europe. We also have two surviving letters from Paul to those new Christians at Thessalonica. In our New Testaments, they are labeled 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. The great road that Paul, Silas, and Timothy travel is called the Via Ignatia. We've already discussed that this is a major Roman highway extending across Greece. On this map, it's marked with an orange line. In Thessalonica, Paul follows his familiar pattern. Paul goes to the synagogue, taking the gospel first to the Jews and preaching that Jesus is the Messiah. He also preaches to those of Greek heritage and many of them believe. But the Jews of Thessalonica who reject Christ are jealous and angry. A riot ensues and Paul makes a swift exit for his next destination. Paul is now poised to travel from Thessalonica in Macedonia to the greatest of the Greek cities, Athens. This is over 300 miles and much of it is traveled by sea. The great city of Athens will be an important stop on Paul's second missionary journey. The structures that we see in this photo are the ruins of the most important buildings of Paul's day. Paul and his companions are witnessing about Jesus in a pagan Greco-Roman society that is sophisticated and complex. It's polytheistic, so the people worship many gods and goddesses. Christianity spreads against this cultural backdrop, and we particularly see evidence of it in Athens. The great flowering of classical Greece, and Athens is at the center of this, happens in the 400s BC. Back then, the Roman Empire did not exist yet. Greek culture and language will be spread by Alexander the Great throughout his empire in the 300s BC. Because of Alexander's conquests, Greek actually becomes the universal language of the Eastern Mediterranean in the ancient world. Much like English today, educated people in many cultures can converse because most everyone has some proficiency in a common language. Even after Rome begins to grow into an empire and conquers Greek lands in the 100s BC, Greek remains that universal language in the Eastern Mediterranean. That's why New Testament writers pen their works in Greek 
It's why Paul always writes to the churches he founds in Greek. Many of the ruins we see today are the great buildings created in the 400s BC. Here's a reconstruction drawing of the Acropolis, the great high place of temples in Athens. So these structures are around 500 years old when Paul visits Athens. They have some age on them, but are well maintained and at the center of the culture in Paul's day. These structures loom high over all of first century Athens. Paul will be witnessing in the marketplace below in the bustling center of the city. Paul's time in Athens begins with these verses. Paul's patiently witnessing for Christ to those who will listen in the marketplace. He's alone here without his companions who have yet to arrive. There are no accounts of miracles in Athens, no record that a church is founded there. Look at Paul's method of witnessing as it's described in this scripture. He's just going out, meeting people in the city, and speaking to them of Christ. I like that this passage makes it clear that there's no planned gathering. He just talks to whoever's in the marketplace. Paul's reaction to pagan Athens is visceral and negative. This translation says he's distressed. Other translations use the word provoked. Infuriated would be another good translation. I like that word. It gives me a greater sense of his gut reaction. The city is filled with idols, which are images of pagan gods. Idolatry surrounds life in pagan Athens. Paul is walking into a city in which the people worship many gods. Images of those gods and temples to them fill the town. Towering over the city is the great Acropolis or high place in the city of Athens. It's the center of the civic and religious life. It's the Temple Mount of Athens, covered in monuments and multiple pagan temples. The temples we see today in ruins are what stood there in the time of Paul. The largest ruin you see here is the Parthenon, the greatest temple in ancient Greece. Built to honor Athena, the patron goddess of Athens, the Parthenon looms over the city. The city's named for her. Athens, Athena, get it? The current ruined state of this structure makes it difficult to appreciate the brilliance of the original architecture. So let me show you an artist's rendering of this temple in its prime. There's an enclosed interior space inside the Parthenon, and inside that space stood the great sculpture of Athena. Here's what Paul has to say about pagan idols, like the Parthenon's cult statue of Athena. Being men God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has a fixed day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. These are Paul's words as he reasons with the Athenians. This is part of the finale of a longer sermon, and we'll get to the rest of that sermon in a minute. The statue of Athena here is a great example of what he talks about. Standing over 40 feet tall, it's covered in gold and ivory. Do you see the little figure of a man in the lower right? It gives you a sense of the awesome scale of this image of the goddess. These temples and images of pagan deities surround the Greeks of Paul's day. Everywhere he looks in the marketplace, around the city, and certainly up on the Acropolis looming over it all, Paul is shocked to see the idolatry that permeates the lives of the Greeks. In Athens, Paul is surrounded by this foreign, pagan, idolatrous culture. 
and he is mightily distressed. What a challenge he faces in explaining the gospel to people who are so far from God. As he says these words, Paul could actually point to the building in which the statue of Athena stands. So here I am in Athens with our Faith Lutheran tour group, uh, which walked in the footsteps of Paul in 2014. I'm reading a famous passage of scripture, a passage that tells what Paul said and did at this place. Do you see there's a big rock behind me? Here's an aerial view of that same rock. It's called the Areopagus. Let's get an idea of the view when you're standing on the Areopagus, because what you see from there is important. So here we've climbed up on this jagged rock outcrop. From there, you get an awesome view of the Acropolis on the neighboring hill with all the pagan temples on it. So Paul stood here on the Areopagus to preach to the Athenians about the one true God. Areopagus means Ares rock. Ares was the Greek god of war. The Romans called this god by the name Mars. You may have heard this rock outcrop referred to as Mars Hill as well. Areopagus and Mars Hill are two names for this same place. The Areopagus is also the name of the legal council in Athens that met here on this rock outcrop. Here's more of the story from the book of Acts. It's what I began reading a minute ago. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious, for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. Now, don't think for a minute that this altar to an unknown God springs from some tender place in the hearts of the Athenians where they really already know the true God that Paul is about to proclaim. Nope. This altar is just one in a huge conglomeration of objects assuring that every possible deity is being bribed adequately. In the Greek mind, there's no sense risking the ire of some unheard of God. So an extra altar is put up just in case. These stand around the city and they have obviously attracted Paul's notice. Both Greeks and Romans erect these altars to gods, both known and unknown. While we'd label all such nonsense superstition, they regard it as simple good sense. And then Paul continues. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Paul witnesses to the one true God in the midst of this pagan idolatry. Paul approaches his witness by citing something with which his listeners are familiar. He uses this familiar example of an altar to an unknown God to proclaim the one true God who does not live in temples like the Parthenon, which at that moment is in everyone's view. We're told in Acts 17.32 that some sneer at his words, but others believe not many in Athens, but a few. Tomorrow we will travel with Paul to his next stop when he leaves Athens for the Greek city of Corinth. There are some wonderful archaeological remains there too.